Anyway, sorry guys, I'm sorry I'm late. Sorry I'm all over the place. So, how is everyone? Good. Good. Let's get this show on the road. We have We have a new member? We have a new member, yes. Hi there, I'm Chris Lujan. Good to meet you. <laughs> Hi Chris. So we'll come back to you, okay? No worries. <laughs> um, being the rule follower that I am. Mm -hmm. Those of you who know me try not to laugh, I know. We'll follow this agenda. And so welcome. Sorry, we're getting a little bit of a late start. Um, as we do, we'll open this meeting, as we do every meeting, with um, uh, comment period, citizens' participation. If there's anyone who would like to address the committee, please come forward, state your name. Seeing no one. We'll move on. Okay, so the second thing is, has everybody had a chance to review the minutes from the October meeting? Are there any additions, corrections, deletions, changes? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Motion to approve. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. All right. Um, so let's go back and pick up some introductions since we have a new member. Okay. Um, we might have a new staff member too, huh? All right. So let's let the new kids introduce themselves and and then we'll quickly tell you who we are too. All right. Sounds good. You want to go ahead, Chris. Right. You first. I'll start. My name is Chris Lujan. I'm with Tate Snyder Kinsey Architects in Henderson and Bethlehem here. So okay. local. Um, excited to be on this uh, committee. First project I worked with TSK was actually on the bus shelters back in 2007. So uh, familiar with the program and, and some of the challenges, but excited you to come You don't look old enough to have worked on something in 2007. <laughs> <laughs> Promise. Someday you'll appreciate that. That's right. But, um, but welcome. We're happy to have you. Thank you. And then we have a new staff person. Hi, uh, my name is David Gloria. Uh, I just uh, began with the agenda team, so I'll be helping Marin and Tammy with the agenda. Terrific. Terrific. So I'll start with who we are. Uh, I'm Erin Breen, and I'm with the Transportation Research Center at UNLV. Uh, Bill Redfern, uh, retired guest. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey, what good you? Um, Audrey Aslan, and um, federal employee, and um, I guess I've been with you guys a couple years now. Yeah. Time yeah. flies. Time flies. Huh? Yeah. Scott Edelblut, Transit Amenity Supervisor, with Carl and Ellen. And I'm Carl. I brought Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I'm Ellen. I brought Carl. <laughs> no, I'm here. I work with Carl and Scott. Marin. Sorry. Uh, I'm Marin Dubois. I'm with the RTC, and I oversee bus shelters. Great. Great. I'm Rick Rosen, and I'm now committee member. I'm meeting. I'm an entrepreneur. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> it's okay, Michael. We're waiting on you. We have a couple new members, so if you could just introduce yourself and tell them who you're with. Cool. I'm Michael Wadley, City of North Las Vegas. Great. Okay. So back to our agenda. Um, Item number three on the agenda is to receive an informational presentation regarding the City of Las Vegas' downtown loop. Now I know why Joanna's here. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanna Wadsworth. I'm with the City of Las Vegas in our Public Works Department, Transportation Engineering Division. And I'm excited to share with you some information on our downtown loop uh, program. So it's a new mobility option within our downtown area. It is a, was a vision of our mayor and it was to provide a transportation option for folks to circulate within our downtown area. So to encourage folks to come to downtown, park your car, and not need your car until you're ready to leave. Or take transit into downtown and then have a way to circulate. Even better. It's even better. So this was a fantastic partnership uh, between the City of Las Vegas and the Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, so we are uh, funding the project, and RTC is overseeing uh, the contract, and Keolis is the operator and um, of the service. 
So the downtown loop, uh, it's, uh, we're almost at it, its six month anniversary actually, so we're mid-year. Uh, it launched officially on June 27th. It did start a few days before June 27th to work out kinks. But you can see it's a cutaway uh, style uh, shuttle bus. Our internal graphics uh, team came up with the exterior wrap, which I think is very uh, flashy. You definitely see it coming down the street. And then the back, I don't have a picture of the back, but it's very cute. It's got the uh, showgirl blowing kisses at the cars behind it. So it's actually <laughs> really, really cute. Uh, the launch event was a lot of fun. Uh, I was not there, but I saw all the pictures. Uh, it started at City Hall and uh, media loaded the shuttles and it circulated on the route and picked up special guests along the way. So a showgirl uh, from the outlet mall, a mobster from the mob museum and picked up Elvis along the way too, uh, culminating at City Hall where you can see they had the christening with the mayor and MJ was there to also participate in the kickoff event. So a lot of fun. So this is the route. Uh, it starts at the BTC. So there is a stop right outside, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, if you come there with transit, once you walk outside the main doors to on the west side of the building, you'll be able to see the stop. We have a very distinguished uh, stop uh, station, I guess, signage. It's hot pink. And uh, above that uh, is a circle. We call it the lollipop sign that has the downtown loop logo on it. So you could definitely see the sign. And the service goes in a clockwise direction. So once it leaves the BTC, it heads to Bonneville, down Bonneville to Grand Central Parkway. And then we have a stop in front of the outlet mall. So at the southern, um, the county government <coughs> south traffic signal, uh, essentially in that area. It does a uh, return trip on the Iron Horse Loop heading back north on Grand Central Parkway back to Bonneville and then north on Main Street. Uh, the next stop is, is the Fremont West or Plaza Hotel stop. It's right at the end of the Fremont Street experience. It has uh, north to uh, Stewart and then there's a stop in front of the, uh, across the street from Mob Museum since it's on the south side of the street. We recently had a route uh, modification. Originally, uh, it, the route came and it it went to Las Vegas Boulevard and then headed south on Las Vegas Boulevard with a stop in front of the red garage. But through discussions with passengers and businesses, we continued it on uh, Stewart to 6th, down 6th, and then to better serve the Fremont East Entertainment District, have a stop right there at uh, 6th Street and Fremont uh, in, in front of um, the uh, therapy, uh, roughly. And then it gets back on the route with a stop at Pond Stars one down at the Arts District and then back to uh, Bonneville Transit Center. So we estimate that that entire loop is roughly 20 minutes. It's probably a little bit longer than 20 minutes depending on demand and people getting on and off. But it's a very comfortable ride. The drivers are well versed as to what are at each stop so they provide a lot of information to the ridership. We, we receive a lot of uh, great feedback actually from folks that ride the loop. So hours of operation on your printouts, there uh, is an error that I just caught. It's Monday through Thursday, 11.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Your printout says 1.30 a.m. So just add a little one in front of there. Uh, and that, that's to capture you know, business traffic, your normal, typical business uh, day activity. Uh, Friday and Saturday, it uh, starts in the mid-afternoon to midnight to capture the more late-night activities on Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday, recognizing the brunch crowd and those that may be leaving, uh, you know, mid-afternoon on Sunday, it's the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. hours. How many, has anyone here ridden the loop? Have you been to our downtown? Definitely take advantage of it. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, mid-September and we're having a pretty good ridership. Uh, this was taken uh, from folks getting on at Mob Museum. So it is, it, it does get busy. And this, uh, on this particular trip that uh, we took, there were only three seats that were vacant. So we are seeing a lot of folks uh, using the loop. Uh, just to give you an idea, the total uh, ons uh, per month. So we have our July, August, September, October ridership numbers. Uh, November is uh, coming and then we're currently in December. So we'll see how the numbers are for the these last two months. But you can see it started out at 3,200. Uh, August we had a little bit of a peak I think because of the PR and 
uh, just getting the word out. People were using the shuttle, and so uh, you know, peaked at 3,900, and now it's kind of stabilizing at that 3,800, 3,700 um, mark. So we average about 100 people per day is using um, the shuttle. It's uh, really good, good reception. Uh, just another slide on the number of ops. Um, but then also of interest, uh, we are interested in seeing where are people getting on and off the shuttle. So Bonneville Transit Center is definitely a hub. That's where a lot of people are getting on and off the shuttle. Uh, premium outlet mall, or definitely that is very high ridership on the, on the regular RTC transit routes, but we're also seeing it here at, um, on, on our downtown loop. The Fremont in Maine uh, is, a, is a heavy one. What I have seen when I've ridden it, folks do go uh, make a transfer at Bonneville Transit uh, Center. They take it to the Fremont, Maine in order to access uh, the hotel. I've seen folks get on with their uh, suitcases and travel uh, gear and then make that a destination to access their, their rooms or you know, while they're staying. Uh, and then Mob Museum, Fremont East, Confaz and Arts District. Um, have decent ridership. So we're, we're interested to see how ridership will change uh, with the relocation of the Fremont East stop. It used to be on Las Vegas Boulevard just south of Fremont. I was a little bit hidden, there's columns, and so it was not an inviting stop, I, I would say, and so changing it to be directly on Fremont Street, I, I hope to see some uh, ridership pick up there. We do have some enhancements underway, which we're pretty excited to roll out. Um, they'll be rolling out in the next uh, two weeks. Uh, well, right now, actually, there is Wi-Fi uh, on, there's two vehicles that circulate. So there's Wi-Fi on both vehicles. Uh, there is a tracking system on the vehicles. And so right now, we do have a prototype of the app that will launch. Um, and once it does launch, you'll be able to have on your phone see where the bus is at. So if you're at the outlet mall and you want to know, do I have 20 minutes or can I check out and buy this purchase before the bus comes, <laughs> you'll be able to know where that bus is and how much time you have uh, to um, you know, head over to the stop. So that's a, that'll be a really exciting enhancement uh, for us. And then also, uh, I believe next week, the kiosks, uh, they were delivered uh, last week. Uh, they're finalizing the content on, there, there'll be a, a uh, interactive screen on one side and then static just kind of decal on the back side and you will also be able to track the vehicle on that interactive screen too. So if you were at the stop and you didn't have a cell phone, you would be able to look on there and see where the loop is. And so we are looking to install those either next week or the week after with the holidays and staffing um, uh, you know, to be determined, but it will be within the next two weeks. So that will be a very nice enhancement uh, for the stop. Uh, another enhancement that we're doing is there's a little bit of dif uh, distance between stops and if you're at either World's Market Center or somewhere in an intermediate area, uh, you may not know how far or where to go to get the loop and so we are adding some way additional wayfinding signs. So it'll have the round uh, loop sign on the top with an arrow to direct you to the stop. And then we are also, uh, we have purchased sidewalk clings, so from the vendor, that's why I was contacting <laughs> you, Erin, for the vendor. So we were able to uh, work with, um, in fact, I can't name, think of the name of the company, like Las Vegas Color, I think it is, and order clings, and then we'll have those along the sidewalks uh, to the loop stops as well. On a neat uh, little side um, information I will provide is this is the, route for the downtown loop, but we also have underway is our driverless shuttle project. And that is a very exciting de pilot deployment. It is a partnership with Keolis and AAA, and it is the first driverless shuttle to be deployed in mis mixed traffic and connected to the traffic signals. So you are in a vehicle without a driver, and it is navigating our streets, stopping for the, the red lights, uh, you know, proceeding through the traffic signals. There's, and it's right here in the Fremont East Entertainment District. So if uh, the main pickup drop-off location we're finding is at the Container Park. So if you pick up the sh uh, little driverless shuttle at Container Park, you would head uh, east on Fremont Street. It's also a, a clockwise uh, pattern. So it goes south on 8th Street, uh, makes a right and heads west on Carson, 
and then north on 6th Street, and then back on Fremont. So right now it's more of a entertainment, mm -hmm. trying to get the word out, get people uh, to, you know, able to experience a driverless vehicle. It's free, it's open from uh, Tuesday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, so if you find yourself down in this area or if you have time and you'd like to check it out, definitely check it out. Uh, that's why um, the pilot is underway so that we can obtain feedback and then and learn from this pilot. And so with that, I'll um, answer any questions that you might have. Yes. Driverless shuttle. Who, yes. Who is it that cusses at the other drivers if there's no driver? I know, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because we, uh, the driverless shuttle follows the rules of the road. And so there are six traffic signals, but two stop controls. There's a stop control right there at 8th and Carson. And so we were heading down. I was riding in the vehicle. We were heading down, and the vehicle stopped. And then it, you know, it did a full stop, and the car behind us was honking at us. <laughs> so, you know, it didn't do a California roll and go through the intersection. So it, it is a, a very unique experience, and it's, um, you know, little things like that to figure out how does it interact with other drivers, how does it interact with uh, people, and then. Uh, we have active crosswalks in, in that area too, so how do people walking you know, perceive the vehicle? Any other questions? So did you mention what the cost was on the loop? Free. Oh, the, that's free mm -hmm. too. That's okay. free too, yes. Awesome. And so right now, and I will mention that we have funding, it's a pilot, we wanted to see ridership and how it would be received by businesses and the public. It is funded right now through June 2018. And then uh, we will be making a determination I, in the next month uh, for continuing that service and funding it beyond uh, 2018. The kiosks, yes. um, do you know where you, are you putting those at every stop? Do you know which Every stop. stop. Okay. Yeah, there'll be every stop. Uh, there are two, well actually three additional ones. Um, there will be one at City Hall. Uh, and so in addition to the seven stops, one at City Hall. They're gonna, we are going to install one uh, right here on this corner, so Grand Central Parkway, oh, excuse me, this corner, Grand Central Parkway in Bonneville, uh, just so that folks uh, from World Market Center or Government Center could have access. And then we were also looking at 4th Street at Fremont, so that just kind of just south of Mid Fremont Mont. near the larger uh, ridership bus stop um, on 4th Street. To add them as stops or just the... You know, it's just going to be yeah. informational to uh, direct them to the stops. It'll, uh, while the ones at the stops will say next shuttle in like five minutes or ten minutes, those will direct you to um, the stops. And uh, the vendor uh, will be talking with the adjacent businesses, so they will have content on there for, um, you know, uh, nearby restaurants or, you know, businesses, so they will have some... Uh, you know, information about idea. the area. Yeah. And they're solar, so they essentially just, you know, bolt into the sidewalk and, um, you know, could be moved around easily if needed. So is there a computer on board the kiosk? The screen? Uh, is it? It's, it, it's a computer in the sense that it is a, um, a preloaded with um, menus, I guess, so you, you would, you know, navigate through the menus. For the information but not something someone wants to steal I mean, no not. yeah no it's integrated in and uh, i would hope not and i would hope they would not <laughs> vandalize them either but that's what we will see well, yeah, that'll, <laughs> that'll be really interesting too yeah. to see what happens with that. yeah no for sure hopefully for there's sure. enough eyes on them that they yeah. won't go away yeah um, any other questions can, can the kiosks uh, also, I mean, will they be able in the future to sell regular bus tickets or? You know, right now um, we have not had that discussion uh, because the, the loop uh, is free, um, there's no cost, but, and I think uh, RTC may be moving to more the app-based payment, um, and so, I mean, that could be an enhancement we could talk about in the future, but uh, right now, no. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that, like other big cities, we have a free loop in the downtown yeah. area that's, I think that's. Exciting. Yeah, and with all of the improvements in our downtown, uh, there's so many restaurants and destinations that you could spend your time looping around and visiting them all. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to item number four.
uh, receive an informational presentation regarding the Southern Nevada Strong Regional Plan. So pretty. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ray Latrup. I'm the manager of regional planning here at the RTC. Um, I oversee um, a new initiative here at the Regional Transportation Commission called Southern Nevada Strong. And we thought some parts of it would be really relevant to this group um, and maybe just kind of connect a little bit of dots as far as what you guys do here and how it implicates kind of our long-term vision for the future. So a little bit of history. Um, Southern Nevada Strong is actually um, the output, the product of a uh, three-year planning process uh, that started in 2011 when the Regional Planning Coalition received a three and a half million dollar grant from the Housing and Urban Development Department. Um, our community came together and said it's finally time for us to collectively decide what we want to be in the long, long-term future and all 13 of our local and regional governments got on board and really adopted this idea of one regional plan. In 2014, that was finally completed um, with the publication of a regional plan, um, a implementation matrix, four different opportunity site studies, and thousands and thousands of phases of back research, including surveys and input from over 70,000 residents. So we stand on pretty firm ground saying that this is our vision for the future. Um, and at the end of the planning process, um, the region really had a discussion about what does this look like going forward and where does it live? And the RTC, which is our Metropolitan Planning Organization, as well as our transit authority, stood up and said, we'll take it because we're already doing regional transportation planning. And um, I'll get into exactly what, what's included in the regional plan, but transportation is a big component of it. So um, our 13 original partners, like I said, are all of our regional and local governments, including the school district and the conservation district, the housing authority, and UNLV, mostly um, <coughs> what you would expect when we talk about our public agencies. Since we've been working on the plan here as a staff, and working towards implementation, we've included additional partners to make sure that as diverse and comprehensive as our regional plan is, there's expertise and relevance from additional stakeholders like United Way, the police department, the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, the Urban Lands Institute, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and NDOT, which hadn't previously participated. So in this capacity, um, the RTC really serves as core administrator. We bring people together to talk about what the plan is. We kind of teach people how to contribute to the overall vision. We provide some tools, and then we also just talk generally about goals in our valley so that all of us can align and work on, on collectively implementing the vision for the future. Southern Nevada Strong is broken up into four themes. I'm gonna go through those themes and talk just high level about what their goals are, but also I brought out a few pieces that I think are really relevant to the work you guys do here on this committee. So um, our first major theme is improving economic competitiveness and education. You can imagine in 2011 and 2012 when people were starting to plan what a regional plan would look like, diversifying the economy was a really large conversation at that point and making sure that our community would invest in sectors that would create well-paying jobs. That was really important as well. So the goals in this theme really look at um, how um, the built environment can support economic development as well as education, and you can also think about ways to access those institutions as well. Um, how our community can really support workforce and training, how we can invest in entrepreneurship, look at a you know, very well competitive, um, well um, achieving uh, school district, which is really important and then overall alignment and collaboration to make sure that educational institutions are brought into the fold of a lot of our other economic activity. Um, a really easy way to see this at work is to look at the Las Vegas Medical District, which right now is in um, downtown Las Vegas, um, just west of the 15 freeway, where UNLV is gonna put their medical school, where we have UMC, which is a trauma one level center, 
Um, and now the city really looking at how does the built environment conducive to that education experience, and then also how does that also how does that also attract additional medical um, industries, sectors, and businesses. <clears throat> so um, it's also a a very dense uh, kind of development in the medical district. Um, a lot of the conversations currently are around parking, access, pedestrian safety, walkability. Um, it's a really big, important priority to how that district is going to be developed in the future. Um, the second theme of the plan um, is called investing in complete communities. Um, by far, this is the largest plan, the largest theme in the plan. It is um, five goals here and 20 different objectives and 118 strategies. I left the, um, the punchline, uh, or left it out earlier. Um, the Southern Mount Strong includes 302 strategies that our department is continue, continuing to look at and implement. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of work to kind of just make sure that we're um, tracking all of them. So 118 strategies go into investing in complete communities, where we're really looking at stabilizing neighborhoods. Um, this, this theme really looks at affordable housing and access to housing, and quality housing, and options for housing. Looking at how different housing options, like townhouses, row houses, apartments, multifamily homes, single family homes, um, really can lend to a really diverse community because it uh, is accessible to all income levels and all types of family. This also talks about how we access healthy food and medical services and community services and public safety um, is a huge part of this one as well. In addition to um, your typical environmental concerns like resource efficiency and conservation. We see some really interesting community collaborations that came out of um, investing in complete communities. Southern Nevada Health District um, recently unveiled their community health improvement plan, and a one third of that plan uh, is really about the built environment and about complete streets and infrastructure as it relates to public health, as well as access to health services. That's a huge step forward, we think, as far as how the, pu the public health community really views um, the built environment and how it's really um, part of their goals. There's also some really um, creative uh, work going on with uh, making sure that uh, there's food uh, available to children in schools, um, breakfast before the bell, other additional food pantries and mobile food units um, during the summer months to make sure that kids are fed um, when they wouldn't be um, in school time. Mm -hmm. Um, probably the most relevant piece of the, theme, of the regional plan to this group is increasing transportation choices. Um, you can imagine that the RTC is actually the lead for the majority of the goals and strategies in this theme. Um, really, it's um, looking at a modern transit system, connecting bike and pedestrian infrastructure, and developing safe and efficient road networks. Um, most of the work related to bicycle, to walkability and bikeability and safety falls underneath increasing transportation traits. You know that the RTC is doing some significant planning around Maryland Parkway. Really looking at multimodal connections for the whole valley is a huge piece of transportation choice. Um, recently, uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, released and published a regional bicycle and pedestrian plan. And um, this really also looks not just at the infrastructure, but also at design standards that are really important to the built environment. I actually have right here a trusted implementation matrix. Um, and I just wanted to point out, so underneath the first goal of investing in um, transportation <coughs> choices is developing a modern transit system that's integrated with neighborhoods, employment centers, and better connecting people to their destinations. So, um, one of the strategies underneath that is improving the rider experience by locating stops away from adjacent travel lanes, offering robust lighting, and making other site considerations that maximize visible visibility and safety. So it's right here in the plan as far as the work that you guys do and everything that's related to um, transportation choice. So you didn't even know you're part of implementing the regional plan. The last part of the plan, um, the last theme is building capacity for implementation. 
Um, this is where we get into um, what does leadership look like and how does our community step forward and do the important work that needs to get done for this plan to succeed. We really uh, prioritize uh, public engagement in this plan, not only during the writing phase of it, but now during implementation. We go out just like this, we make presentations and make sure that a lot of people are aware of the plan and our efforts moving forward to progress it into fruition. We also really prioritize trying to get voices from all of our different communities and minorities and populations included in this work because that's really important for us. We work with other agencies to talk about collaboration and talk about prioritizing goals. Um, we're building capacity for leadership and for uh, work to be done. We're also discussing local funding strategies and how to build up revenue in order to make implementation easier for our partners. One of the things we've decided to invest in next year is some workshops on how our community can be more um, competitive and ready for when there's grants from national foundations and the, and the federal government. So um, yeah, we're just trying to make sure that everybody knows what's going on and how they can contribute individually and also part of the agency or organization that they work with. <clears throat> Oh, and there's a picture from our grant strategy meeting where we got about 15 nonprofit grant writers to kind of discuss some challenges and opportunities when it comes to our community uh, receiving grant funding as a means to increase revenue for implementation of the plan itself. Um, so the regional plan is really big, really diverse but also very relevant to everybody in our community and everybody in all of their private lives and their work lives. And we think it's really important that we connect with all of our residents. We have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter, we have a newsletter, and we also have ample opportunities for people to engage in our working groups um, as we look going forward around themes, issue areas, and sometimes we look at geographies. There are um, individual reports uh, written during the planning phase around what does the vision of Southern Nevada Strong look like at four opportunity sites. That's Maryland Parkway, um, the Medical District, um, Boulder Highway at Gibson down in Henderson, and downtown North Las Vegas. Places that could really use some investment and some encouraging uh, work around them. So in the coming year we think we're going to continue to work on those four sites. Overall we're just really invested in building relationships with leaders and partners so that um, we can all be a part of making Southern Nevada stronger. And that's it. Any questions? <coughs> yeah. Is the full plan available at southernnevadastrong.org? It is available online. I also have um, a copy if you would like to take one on your way out. If nobody else wants it, I'll take it. Oh, I actually have like eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a pocket of them. Yeah, I'll take them. We're lucky we had um, our annual summit last week where we get our community groups together and we talk about all the great successes we've had in the previous year. So we just made a bunch of these that have all of the reports on them. And you're welcome to take one on your way out. Great. Since I missed the, we had a, I had another meeting last we, Wednesday, so. We did videotape it. And we already have a highlight reel in production. So. Anything? Awesome. Okay, thanks, Ray. And then uh, <coughs> it's evidenced by show and tell. The last thing, um, the last report given will be to receive an informational presentation regarding a possible new solar <coughs> lighting instrument. Well, guys, we're going old school today. I didn't get the product in until late, so I didn't have a chance to uh, make a PowerPoint. So I'm going to give you a couple handouts here of uh, what the lights look like when they're dark. Very good. You heard, follow. 
All right, as I said earlier, my name, Scott Edelblut. I work in the transit amenities section with Ellen and Carl. And uh, I'd like to give some quick facts about our section here. As of November 2017, the RTC has 3,400 bus stops out on the street right now. Of those bus stops, 1,735 shelters have lighting capabilities. That leaves us with 1,665 bus stops without shelters. They have just amenities or signs with poles. And some of those are illuminated by uh, street lights and others do not have lighting at all. I've been tasked by my team leaders to get lighting at these stops. So what I did is I've reached out to a couple manufacturers and here's two examples of what we were able to get. And uh, hopefully we can get these out to non-lighted areas and provide a sense of security to our customers. And these two, let's see, where are we going here? Uh, I would uh, like some recommendations, comments, concerns, and some definite input on uh, what you think our customers would like at the stops. When we decide on the functionalities that best suit our customers, we'll be able to go out to bid on different models. And we may not get these exact models or this look, but uh, your input will help us develop our scope of work and it will help us finalize our design that uh, will hopefully will enhance the lighting, give us the best light possible for the money that we're going to spend on them. Uh, the two models we have here, one is from an urban solar. It's a single panel, 10 watt, three LED bulbs right here with three watt bulbs. This is from ASD. It's a 28 watt solar panel. Actually, it has three solar panels. They're built into the design right here, which actually helps the functionality of uh, the solar collecting with its angles and reference to the sun and, and help that out. But uh, like I said, uh, the final product will be the same concept and with a potential and difference of shape, lighting, ability, and brightness. And that's where I'd like you to look at your handouts. You can see the, the, the difference in the two. Remember I said that both of these have three watt bulbs here, but due to the way that the design and the application of the light is the presentation that you're going to get. The first one here, as you can see, puts out a, a brighter light. It, it, it fills up the room, actually. It uh, gets you about 15 feet in all directions. And the way this one is designed, this, this one's cantilever, by the way. This is sort of cantilever. It's got a straight down application. And this gets you about five feet in front of the light and about two feet in back. But uh, you're going to pay, like I said, you're going to get what you pay for. Uh, specifications, they, they both have three watt bulbs. The approximate life of the bulb is going to be about five years. The one on the left has a programmable controller on it. Where right now, if we disable that controller, we just have it hooked up straight to power. So we can get a good source there. And that's, that's what you see in the light there in a dark warehouse. This one is a push button activated. The board's been blown, so I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. Nah, it's not great. So anyways, that push button timer, it has a board in it with a timer mechanism that allows the circuit to run for five minutes. And then the light extinguishes. And then if you want to reactivate it, you have to go out and re-push it again. Personally, I like the dust to dawn version just because it, it stands out, it's visible. It's there for the customers. They can see it from a long way off. It's good for the bus drivers. The way they're oriented here, this is probably the direction of travel as you're coming down the street. You're going to have your bus sign here. As you can see, it's going to be illuminated. It's going to give you a good presentation. You're going to have your bench and can out here for your customers, so they're going to be able to sit under the light. Same thing here. You're going to have your sign, be illuminated, and your bus driver's going to be able to see it. 
doesn't put off as much light as I hope, but like I said, you pay, you get what you pay for. And what would that be, what you pay for? Well, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> well, you've said it twice, so I thought. Okay, well, I'm getting there. No, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, they have programmable controllers. This one's a push button with a timer. That one has functionality to it. We can, we can program it for days, different times. We can turn it on at certain times, turn it off at certain times, whatever we feel, you know, due to what ridership and, you know, when people will be there, just to conserve battery power. Uh, the maintenance, the batteries, they're lead-free acid batteries. We're going to get two to three years life out of each battery. They do have an option with the lithium ion, but the cost really is not beneficial to what you can get with the lead acid right now. We need the cost to come down to actually make that worthwhile. These lead acid, we'll get two to three years of life out of them. With the lithium ion, you're looking at five years, but the, like I said, there's a big cost factor there. Operational temperatures, we're looking at minus 20 degrees to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Warranties, they're going to vary from one to five years on the bulbs and on the panels, one to ten years. Installation time, which is going to affect us directly, impact our section. It, uh, it's about 30 to 60 minutes, depending on what we're going to do and how much work we have to do to the tail spars that are out there. Uh, installation height, we want to run them up to 9 to 11 feet, and most of our tail spars go to 10 feet, so we're going to have to put an extension cap on here. This one comes with an adapter plate that fits right on, and this one's manufactured with this adapter plate because it has a round receiver, so they've added an actual two-foot extension right here with a round cap on it to, to go into the receiver. Okay. Approximate weights are about 30 to 45 pounds. And we'll get to the price now. The one right here in front of me is about uh, $1,000. And they range up to around $1,500 from what I've seen. And once we start the bid process, we'll see how they come in. But the one there with the programmable controller, that's about $1,200. So depending on the functionality and the difference in batteries and manufacturing costs and whatever, that's, that's where we're looking, $1,000, $1,500 per unit. We're looking at maybe 300 units to start with and get them out on the street. And uh, what I would like to ask you guys for a little input, I'd like you to think about it, maybe not today, but sometime you can get back to us, you know, the size and the shape of what you would like to see. How would you like to see the lights? Uh, do you like the presentation of the, the embedded lights? Or do you like something that's out more clear and in the open? That's a polycarbonate shield. It is. It looks fragile, but it's really not fragile. You probably have to shoot it to break it. Don't, don't uh, quote me on that, but I'm going to go with it. And uh, you know, this one doesn't have any screening. Maybe some ideas that you have. We can also uh, powder coat it. We can go with RTC colors, or we can do whatever, gold and blue, and run around the frames, our, brand it with RTC, you know, if you guys would like to see that. Uh, alternative mounting methods. We, bought, we can also shield this. We can, we can take a three-inch diameter steel pipe and put it over that, and we can powder coat that also to, to whatever we want, just to give it extra strength on the telespar if we're having problems with that. But uh, that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. Yes, sir. Is that as high as that one goes? No. What we're looking at putting these up at the regulation is seven feet from the bottom of the sign. We're looking at taking this whole pole up. I had, I had to shrink these down just to get them in here. So we're, taking, we're going to take it up to nine to 11 feet. I thought for sure you were going to tell me that there was a huge price difference. No. Because when you're looking at them, one is aesthetically very nice and you would want it. Mm -hmm. And the other one is not. Just 
Yeah, and that's what we'll see. It, it depends on the manufacturer and this the the one that is, is aesthetically pleasing also would illuminate part of the sidewalk and exactly. or more of the sidewalk to so that you could see people waiting and this one does not. So yeah. um, I would love to see these up and down busy streets, not just at not just at bus stops, but to actually light the sidewalk for and I know it's something you guys are looking at, Joanna. Um, so that you know, street lights aren't meant for pedestrians; they're meant to light the road for cars. And exactly. this would help people see pedestrians. I, I, and and I think it's it's very handsome. <coughs> the black one's very handsome. Thank you. Do you guys like the idea of the timer dusted on operation or the push button for the riders? To me, far and away, dusted on. Right. Yeah. That's. And I'm another thing with this. With this light here, this is all pretty much custom made. So when we go to Spare Parts, we're pretty much limited to going back to this supplier. This is off the shelf equipment right here. And this light bulb here is what we use in all our general market shelters. So there is cross compatibility there. The only downside I yeah. see to that one is the light bulb being exposed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even if you do have to shoot it, so they're going to find a way to, unfortunately. But. Um, and another good thing about this is we have on our general market shelters, we have flexible solar panel mats, and we, we adhere them pretty good. We use pretty, pretty tough adhesive, but they do climb up there and they strip them and they bring them down and they end up missing. But th this one's kind of neat the way the design is. It's kind of built right in, and once you take it up, you really can't tell that these are solar panels. Right. So that's another, another positive. Uh, you know, you can't really see this one, but you can kind of know what's happening there. Scott, Nathan has something. Yeah, thank you, Nathan Goldberger. Yeah. Um, I think just in preference for the dust filter on, we, we wouldn't, from a customer service perspective, want the drivers to get under the impression that if the light is on, it's a customer there. Mm -hmm. Off there isn't. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's on, the dust comes on, you don't have that issue. Um, the only thing You know, we can even we can even shield that too. Like say this is your travel yeah. travel path. You know, this, this actually this is the back panel for this, right. so it's fully enclosed. But there's you know we can actually put a shield up too if there's any kind of complaints about about the backyard issue. Yes, sir. Just from a practical standpoint, to be right the bus. If I have to walk up there and then hit the button. It defeats the purpose of lighting the sidewalk and stuff like Aaron was talking about. If I have to be there first, eh, I think this one's much more sensible mm -hmm. in that it lights up a bigger area and it lets you see what there might be. You know, I mean, there's different little things at the bus stop that you are, are not aware of at night. I think one is much better than the right. other. Right. You know, and this is designed to for power consumption because you got to remember this is um, a battery. So if nobody's around, and do you really want the light on? Personally, I do, if it's a bus stop. But some agencies decided that they haven't. They do have these active. They sent references. I haven't had a chance to reach out to them yet, but there's 16 agencies running these. So, and like I said, I, they look like they're smaller agencies, so I'm really not sure until I reach out and talk to them. This, this guy here, this <coughs> manufacturer is local. He, he, put the, he puts these out in a lot of homeowners, HOA, residential, and parking lots and stuff like that. He has a lot of them up in Canada. He has them in Belize. And he has them in Tennessee. He just got a big contract with Warren Buffett uh, and his property management group. So they are tried and true, and they, they work. So not that my opinion matters too much, but I like that he's a local, you know, we can source it out of Nevada. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it helps parts too. It's yeah. really easy, really accessible. Right. Can they frost this? Is yeah. that a, I mean, I don't know how much yeah, that. We can actually take, we can take this diffuser off that light and just have the straight LEDs, and then we, we probably could frost that. You know, I mean, I don't know if that would that would lower the, how much yeah. it illuminates the, mm -hmm. the 
Well, and I don't know how bright it would be. It, so, and, and so being lower, it might not. You yeah, know, as you go up, it's kind of going to dissipate itself. The higher, the higher. Well, you I go guess up. I was just talking about from the, you know, if it's. I mean, I've been in a lot of public hearings where people are adamant they don't want something like this. Their backyard is right here, and they've got this light. And when it's diffused, it's a lot less of a yeah, most of, of, of an issue. They can do stuff to this so it's <coughs> down a little bit. Or if it's one-sided, like I said, we put right. some kind of shielding up or, or that direction. Well, that's, that's all good input. That's what we'd like to hear, just whatever idea you guys have. Is there any idea on upkeep? I mean, does somebody have to clean those panels and, and, and stuff like that on a weekly, monthly time basis? Yeah, we we formulate a, a preventative maintenance plan and we get out there and take care of them. Yeah. OER section yeah. responsibility. We do general maintenance on it, checking the batteries, cleaning them up, making them visible, taking care of graffiti. We go with some kind of branding. We do some touch-up painting and whatever needs. Is that it? Is Yes, sir. I will go on a counter to the aesthetic. To me, that doesn't reflect any of the design styling that uh, the RTC has been working on lately, whether it's the styling of their actual buses themselves with the curves and the movement. That does look HOA grade. And I start thinking about how these are deployed across the city. And I almost wonder if at a time, even though this might be installed before a shelter comes, will it start to look counter to what the rest of the identity and branding is for, for the RTC's uh, facilities? <coughs> is this his only only design? Uh, he has a different design. Something more than this this look right here. And what I found is if you don't kind of if you don't counter if you don't cantilever the lights, that light's gonna be directly over the pole. So if you don't have any kind of diffuser or reflector to push that light out, then you're just really limited. Then you then you get the look. Yeah, you're just. What you're doing there. What does the and, and second, and secondly, this is going to act as secondary. It's going to illuminate this light or this sign too. It's going to help the customers and the passengers with uh, just their presentation. They're available, be available in fewer buildings, stuff like that. And we'll definitely brainstorm things about it. You know, like I said, this is just two two versions of probably a lot of stuff once we start digging into it. And then uh, we can do another briefing and let you guys see what other stuff we come up with. And Madam Chair, if I may, when we first started with the general market bus shelters, we wanted something that was design-wise similar to some of the BRT stations. Mm -hmm. And we, we reached out to all the shelter manufacturers and there was really nothing that existed. So we started walk, working with some of the manufacturers and uh, there was a company out of the UK called Trueform that was willing to basically custom design a shelter for us. And that's how the, we got the ones on the strip. By the time we got around to procuring the general market shelters, all those original manufacturers who said, no, we won't customize, we're now customizing. And so that's how we ended up with the general market shelter. So once we identify the features that we like and what we're looking for, uh, I think there will be some room for uh, getting something that's uh, more to our standard once we figure out what that is. Well, and truthfully, if I was a business owner and you wanted to put that in front of my business, I wouldn't be very happy. The white but The white one. Yeah. But if, if you wanted to put the other one in front of my business, it would enhance the not. I like the functionality of this one. I, I have to admit, I don't like it doesn't fit aesthetically, but I would expect that that might change, like yeah. you said, as People start to see that there's a market for it, and there's a. What aesthetics don't you like? Just as. It looks like curious. something. I mean, I, I don't. I don't want to be the naysayer, but it looks like something from 1970. Looks like or the carriage light on the front of your house that they make you keep on all day. Right. So I mean, it, as far as functionality and and practicality, I mean, it it probably solves the problem. But then, you know, I don't. I don't know what the investment is. I don't know how many. I, obviously, you told us how many there's going to be. But, so I don't know how that fits into the whole, like you mentioned, the brand and the, the look. And we're going with a very modern look. So I don't know. Maybe if it was a different color. Maybe it didn't have that spire on top. 
But so. see, I'm being picky That's now, I like about and it. I don't want to be picky about about what it looks like. But in reality, we kind of have to be picky about what it looks like. That's but so I, funny, Audrey, because all things you don't like is exactly what I like. About. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like modern, and I like I like where we're going with the look of a lot of the things that I see in the city, and I love the new architecture on a lot of the new buildings, and this doesn't. And I'm trying to think, well, how could you incorporate a solar panel that has to have an angle on it that has to, you know. It should know. probably be neon lights. Yeah. <laughs> neon so, I mean, that's not really a so problem for me problem to solve. We don't have power. But we have an architect on the, on the yeah, board, so maybe you can The LED, uh, and back home, we, we, we did the research for the what? Only we knew an architect. PVs, right? <laughs> like that. That took a long time, and, yeah. and there's some, some challenges with that too. But so maybe figure it out. So like I, I know we'll find the right fit. This well, is a good move. What is the life expectancy? What is the life cycle of these? What, what do you expect to see them as a, as you you install them? Um, five, five ten. Years. So in, so it might be a good interim um, yeah, solution, it's, it's good good knowing product. that maybe we would find something that was had a little bit different look to it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a piece of furniture, yeah. you know. You start out with, it's a chair, and then you, you kind of evolves into, it's a modern chair, or it's a mm -hmm. traditional looking, so there's. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Anything else? <laughs> anyway? All right. Thanks, Scott. Thank you for your time. Okay, so if there's nothing else, we'll close our meeting the same way we began with a comment period if anyone would like to address the committee. I'll wait with all the instructions and see if someone stands up and seeing no one. Um, when's our next meeting? In February. <laughs> I think I'd be used to this by 15th. February 15th. Okay. So everybody uh, have lovely holidays. Please be careful out there. Uh, it's been a crazy right. year. So we'll South could do better in 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Motion. You take that. Oh, do we have to move, make a motion to adjourn? No, for you just adjourn the meeting. Yeah. I never remember from meeting to meeting which one is formal and which one. I you know. know. We should give you a gavel. Which one do you have to Fair. jump through all the hoops for? And <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Somebody got smart on our side.